Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's very, it's, an, it's a privilege to be, uh, be uh, start this webinar uh, regarding who owns a float. It's an AAC International event uh, hosted by two sections of AAC International, uh, the uh, Greater Cairo section and the uh, Qatar section. Uh, uh, Saad, would you like to uh, say a few words? Uh, before we start? Yeah, thank you so much, Walid. Uh, thanks everyone for attending one of uh, our technical webinars as usual. Uh, and this time uh, it's a co-organized between ASE Qatar and uh, Egypt for the first time. Um, thanks Walid for uh, making this happen. Um, unfortunately, um, I wouldn't be continuing with you guys today. I will not be able to host you due to a medical emergency. So I will leave you in a good hands of uh, Dr. Walid and my colleagues, and I will be listening to you uh, through the background. So uh, Walid, the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Saad. Uh, just a uh, so I make a correction. Uh, it was, if it wasn't uh, for you, this event would not have taken place. So actually, thank you for the initiative. And. Um, and this, inshallah, will be one of, uh, of, of many uh, uh, cooperations uh, or collaborations between the Doha section and the Cairo section, and actually, in fact, the MENA region section as a whole. Um, so th the topic today is, is this uh, often discussed uh, topic of who owns the float has been discussed a long time ago. And um, first, I'd like to uh, ask a poll. Uh, so um, we have two questions for you. The first question uh, is, um, have you come across a float ownership dispute at work? So did you come across any disputes that have to deal with the deal with float ownership? And number two is, uh, who do you think owns the float? So we'll just give you a few seconds if you can uh, respond uh, to these uh, poll questions. So, okay, we want, we want all of you to, to participate. So, so far, we just have 56 uh, out of 88 participants who participated. So, take a few seconds, please, and, and, uh, and answer the questions. Um, so far, uh, so far, the, have you come across a float ownership dispute at work? Uh, the predominant answer is yes, so far. We have, uh, this, at this second, we have 63 responses uh, out of the 92. And uh, for who do you think should own the floats? As a uh, shared resource is by far the uh, most dominant, uh, 84% so far, uh, followed by contractor, 12%, followed by employer, of just 4%. And um, okay, so uh, thank you very much for uh, your participation. Uh, these, these are the results. I'm sure you can see them now on, on the screen. So uh, first, we'll start uh, by an introduction. Uh, the outline is that we'll first introduce uh, AAC International. We realize that a lot of you may not be aware of uh, what AAC International does, its activities. So just a brief introduction. Then we'll, the, this webinar is basically uh, going to pose uh, seven key questions to our uh, very, very uh, experienced uh, speakers whom I'm, I'm very, very privileged to be with, uh, basically uh, Hossam and Deal, uh, Antoine Nadif, and also um, Ahmed Abdel Bay. So, and uh, Hossam and Antoine are from the Greater Cairo section. Uh, Mr. Abdel Bay is from the uh, Qatar section. So, we'll have those seven key questions that, uh, that deal with the question of who owns the float. They will be posed. To these uh, seven, to these uh, experts, and then we'll open the floor to you guys so that we have an open discussion. Uh, anything you want to raise. So first, uh, uh, AACE International stands for the Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineering. Okay, and it is a U.S.-based 
non-profit professional association that has been serving uh, the total cost management community since 1956. By total cost management community, this is really uh, an, an over-encompassing term that, that, this, that encompasses project management as a whole. So it's not just cost, it's cost, it's planning, it's claims, it's contracts, risk management. Uh, so ASE has been in the business since 1956. And uh, there are over 8,000 members worldwide. The 8,000 number, actually, this is maybe it's, it's, it's a, a year ago or something. The, the num members uh, are expected to have increased in that. And as you can see, the disciplines that are covered by AC International are cost engineering, cost estimating, planning, uh, scheduling, risk man project management. So all these uh, project management related disciplines. And we have... Uh, 100 countries and uh, 90 local sections. So for, for we have, so the, the Greater Cairo is a section, uh, Qatar is a section, UAE is a section. And, and within the states, there are several sections uh, depending on the, the states and in Canada as well. So we have 90 sections, over 100, 100 countries. Uh, there have been certifications and maybe this is something that the ASE is well known for uh, since 1976. These certifications include the Certified Cost Professional, CCP, the uh, Certified Forensic Claims Consultant, which is CFCC, which is really uh, something that's rather new and uh, really applies to those who are interested in, in, in forensic uh, scheduling and, 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 and play analysis and claims uh, consultancy. That's the CFCC. And what's, what's I think what's been very popular is the CCP and the uh, PSP, the Planning and Scheduling Professional, and you have here in the list several other uh, certifications. Now, the Qatar section and the Cairo section are just two of the 90 local sections of AC International. Uh, here's an error here, of course, which don't represent Egypt, they represent Egypt and Qatar. Now, uh, on the topic of uh, floats, uh, ASE has a, has a wealth of resources. Uh, we have an, an annual conference that is held every year since 1957 and uh, we have a, there's a library of, of articles and journals that have been written in all these disciplines that I've, I've, uh, I've discussed with you. So on the topic of floats, we have, you'll see here uh, a, few, a few articles that actually, this, this one for example, uh, is who owns a float. This is an article that was written in uh, 1978 actually. So since the late 70s, this question has been posed. And as we go and scroll down, you find there's another article, for example, Float Ownership Specs Treatment. This is in 1986. And then in 2008, for example, so this is fairly recent, we have Who Should Own the Float and Total Float Management, Renovating and Misuse and Abuse Approach. Just These are just a few of the uh, top articles that have been written on this. And um, If we go to, to uh, we have, actually I have to, it's no, it's no secret, but uh, I'm a, a big fan of uh, an ASE uh, expert. His name is James Zack, who has written uh, a lot on claims, uh, claims, you know, uh, claims overall, and, and uh, especially he talked about claims, uh, games some people play. So he has a very, very interesting article called Scheduling Games. And in these scheduling games, he goes into, this was written actually first in 1992, and he uh, discusses the scheduling games that contractors play and that uh, and the defenses that owners make. Uh, and if we look at the article, we'll find that he lists here, these are the games as you can see, and the defenses. And in one of those games, you will find um, he discusses the um, sequestering of float, as you can see here on the slide. So, so sequestering of the float is where a contractor produces a schedule that actually has very, very little float so that anything the owner would do can affect the critical path of the product. So it's a schedule from the start that has, uh, that is it's flawed as it has very little float uh, available in it. And as you can see here, actually in comparison to the other games, this one is, has, is pretty elaborate. So it has, a, it has a lot of defenses for that, as you can see here from the slide. And the other thing that, uh, that I would want to show is um, that's a very famous article that he has written called Claimsmanship. So these are all our claims games that are played also between 
the contractors and the owners. Again, this article was in 1991. The previous article was uh, actually uh, enhanced in, in recent years. So 1992, he had written the article. 1998, he enhanced it. 2006, he enhanced it even more. Claimsmanship, one of my favorite articles, actually, uh, in general. Uh, he he um, goes into several, he has a contractor's claimsmanship, owner claimsmanship. And one of the contractor's claimsmanship that he has is called project, project float claims. And in this uh, game, as he calls it, uh, he mentions that the legal precedent, remember, recall that this is in 1991, uh, is that absent the contract clause to the contrary, the float belongs to the contractor. So of course, legal precedent here, we're talking about the states uh, at that time. And the game he was talking about is that the contractor would say that if, uh, of course, if there's no clause in the contract, then the contractor would say if the, the float is consumed, he would say that according to the equitable adjustment theory or equitable adjustment formula, you have to restore me to the same position that I was in before this delay of the owner. So that means that the contractor would ask for a time extension, a compensable time extension, to be to have the float restored as it was. So this is just an example of uh, how float was really play, played into the, you know, the, how it was used as, as a source of claimsmanship or, or claims games that are played. And in the, in the end of the article, he talks about uh, solutions to, to the, those claims. And one of those is, is ownership of float clauses. And he mentions uh, here that the float should uh, neither be the property of the owner nor the contractor, but should be a project resource. And as you, most of you answered in the poll, you, all of you, most of you mentioned that it should be a project resource. That was the, as you can see, the theme since the early 90s, okay? Uh, so it's to, to be used as a, on a first come, first serve basis. That's his recommendation. It is not a, uh, uh, an established legal principle, but this is his recommendation at the time. And he refers to something at the end called, uh, as a solution, something called the banked float time, banking of float. Now, hold that thought because at the end of this webinar, we will go into this, this will be one of the questions that will be asked. So uh, with that, I will I will uh, stop sharing when I find where I can stop the sharing. And now, uh, as we mentioned, we will uh, I'll ask uh, our esteemed uh, speakers uh, one by one some question, uh, some questions. First of all, there are seven questions that I mentioned. The first and the seventh are addressed to, to all of each one of them, while in the number two to number six will be addressed to a certain a certain speaker. Okay, so uh, guys, I will first start with a question: uh, What is a float in your opinion, and who should own the float? So uh, I'll start with you, Sam. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, hosting me as uh, one of this uh, esteemed panel. Thank you, Ali, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, I will say a statement that I will uh, keep repeating uh, during the presentation that the, the nature of uh, project construction, construction projects, is uh, tending more and more to be dynamic, which means that every day, every week, every period of time, uh, everybody needs to stop and revisit the sequence, the duration, the performance in accordance with the performance uh, established. So uh, whatever float stored in the baseline is uh, going to be changed somewhere in the middle of the project, at the first of the project. And this is, again, the nature of, or the typical nature of the construction project. So I totally agree with uh, Mr. Zach that is, uh, I wrote down this uh, statement, closed is a project resource as any other shared resource in the project. First comes, first suit. So uh, whoever needs the float should use the float. Yeah, so how, how would you define float? What, what in your mind is it? Well, the definition of float is, uh, the typical definition is some allowed time to delay without impact the total project, the total project duration. So uh, uh, normally when we are dealing with construction project with huge number of activities, some activities are falling into the critical path, which is the longest path of the project at, at, the, at the beginning all over the project. And once this float or the, this uh, path is delayed, 
the whole product of DNA. Consequently, some other patterns are not representing the total duration of the product. It's less than the total duration of the product. Consequently, all the activities on this path are floated. That has some allowed time to be uh, delayed without impacting the total product. Sort of like a buffer. Yeah, a buffer or slack. Sometimes, sometimes they call it slack, buffer, contingency. But it's not a contingency, actually. It's, it, it's something granted by the construction methodology uh, implemented by the contractor who is leading the uh, program development. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, Antoine, uh, how would you define float and, and who do you think should own it? You're muted, Antoine. You're muted, Antoine. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, also, I'm also delighted to be with you today in this beautiful webinar. Um, I would like also to add about the float um, and continuing with, with what Hossein has just said. Uh, that's also not also the, not only the impacting the project completion date, but also the intermediate milestone of the project. So I can measure also the float um, in the intermediate contractual milestone of the project, even if uh, the delays is not impacting um, the, the the project completion date. But I also want to highlight something that um, the definition of who on the floats or the, the approaches of who on the floats is not only about saying that it's for the contractor or for the clients or the shared commodity in the projects but there is also a lot of opinion discussing that one of them is um, is highlighted in the in a book called the construction project scheduling by uh, mc Grubel. it's stating that the the, the, the total flow should be allocated to the various activities uh, on, on the path of the on the path in the schedule uh, proportional to the original duration so this is one of the approaches um, that uh, that Gruhel highlighted in his book. Uh, also, uh, uh, another approach is saying that it should be uh, proportional to the direct cost of this activity. Uh, but the most convenient, the most convenient uh, definition um, of who owns the floats can be also from the party who who carries the risk. So let's say, for example, if you are talking about a lump sum contract. The contractor is the one who carries the, the, the risk of exceeding the project time and budget. So um, someone can say, okay, this is the contractor, he is, is at high risk. So he should be the one who is owning the floats. Also, in another contract type, like a, um, a cost plus free. So the owner here is carrying the risk. So the owner here can be owning the floats. So there is a lot of different approaches in that. It's not only like saying it's for a contractor, for the owner, or it's a shared commerce. Thank you very much, uh, Antoine. Uh, Ahmed, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Walid, and uh, thanks again, Walid and Saad, for organizing the conference. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, just before I answer the question, I, I would like to ask the audience if, if anybody has any question, you can pose it in the QA. Uh, so we can refer to those questions later once we finish the webinar. So if, if anybody has any question, we can post it in a Q&A section, and then uh, we will answer it later on. Uh, back to the question. Uh, I will not have a lot to add on what uh, my colleagues, Hossein and Antoine mentioned, but I, I would like to highlight one, one of the issues which are, are very relevant to the ownership of the float, that there, there is a distinguish between a, a network float and the project float. And, and when I say that, uh, I mean, it might be the case that the contractor planned from the beginning to have a completion date earlier than the contract completion date. Uh, and he allowed uh, in his standard for that, that he will finish, for example, a project of 12 months in a 10 months duration instead of 12. Uh, so that will create a, a two months of a float to all the projects, uh, in addition to the float created by the network itself. Uh, so we will have something called a network float and uh, project float uh, because of that early completion. And uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, the network float, uh, as, as, you, as you both have pointed out, the, the recent international practice like the AEC uh, 29 recommended practice, for example, and the SCL protocol are referring that uh, uh, the network float should be owned uh, by the parties or by the project or a project resource, but uh, the project float, if there is a case of early completion, 
both of the international practice, either the AECI or the SCL, are referring to that float to be owned by the contractor. If there is no agreement, then that float uh, will be owned by the contractor. The SCL have added some restrictions to that by saying that this should be mentioned in the tender stage and, and uh, clearly highlighted in the tender stage by the contractor to apply it. And uh, the AECI 29 recommend practice say that if it is not defined, then uh, it is uh, owned by the contractor. So uh, I thought that uh, uh, distinguish might be helpful for, helpful for the audience. Floor is back, you Thank you, uh, Ahmed, uh, uh, and thank you also for the reminder, and I also reminded everyone again, but um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A uh, chat so that we can, uh, whatever time is available at the end, we'll uh, answer your questions, uh, inshallah. So now I come to my second question, and uh, I'll continue with you, Ahmed. Um, so if the contractor, say, managed to create a flow through I think there's a little problem in the mic, I think. The, the voice is not clear. So. Uh, I believe once you speak, Walid, we start hearing the noise. So it seems that something is wrong with your mic. The same case. Let, let me ask the audience if it is if it is not uh, clear only you from uh, Walid's side. Walid, can you put yourself in mute, please? I just need to know if it's only from your side or it's from all of us. So uh, if the audience can hear us now, please uh, put in the chat box that the voice is better. Uh, yeah, I, I see the audience are saying it's uh, it's from Walid side mainly. They can hear me well. Hello. Can you switch the switch the uh, uh, yeah, I believe there's something wrong in the mic. Maybe we we'll need to put a headset or something like that. Uh, until you fix that, I can I can start answering the question. And until you find a way to fix that uh, mic issue, if that helps. Can you hear me now? Yes, much yes. better. Yes, yes perfect. Now. Right. My question uh, to you, Ahmed, is if the contractor managed to create flows through resequencing of activities, uh, should the contractor in that case be the owner of the float since, since the contractor made an effort and resequenced activities to gain flows? Uh, okay, that's that's a nice question. I, I, I believe if, if you mean that uh, after after uh, after the baseline program is approved and at a certain stage as as, uh, uh, as my colleague mentioned that the project is dynamic. So at a certain stage, that float of the baseline is no more uh, the same and the contractor changed the sequence of a certain bus. Uh, so he created or added additional float to that bus. Uh, then uh, we need to distinguish between if, if that flow is only for a specific bus uh, which he managed to resequence for, it was in the critical bus of the project. So it is a float for all the network, not only for particular buses. If we're talking about the later case that he managed uh, to mitigate on the critical bus of the project, so he created a float for all the network, then it will be debated. Uh, uh, the, the contractor for sure will argue that I have created that uh, float and it should be owned by me and not used by the employer. And the employer will argue that uh, it is a float. So if the float is defined to be owned by the employer, then it is still an employer-owned uh, float. If it is not defined, then we will apply the same theory 
as if it's a float in the baseline and the float will be belonging uh, to uh, both parties as a project resource. And, and again, this will, uh, in, in, my, in my view, uh, I, I would say it will not be fair to allocate that float uh, to the contractor uh, and allow him only to use it uh, because the, the, the employer was, was, uh, was having no hands to create the tree sequence. So he, he should not be blamed for something which he did not create or prevented from using something which he did not create. And in the same time, it will not be fair uh, to allocate that float to the employer, even if the contract defines that the employer owns the float, it will not be fair to allocate that float to the employer. So I would say that it will remain uh, owned by both parties uh, and it will be a project resource. And uh, we, can, we can also here uh, refer to that early completion uh, argument, which I mentioned. Uh, if, if this was clearly uh, notified by the contractor that guys are going to uh, rechange the sequence to achieve an early completion, and if that early completion is accepted by the employer, then yes, the contractor might be allowed to own that float and make use of it. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, now we talked about the contractor uh, resequencing activities to create float. So, Antoine, uh, to you, I'd ask a question. Uh, now, the owner. So, if the owner managed to create float through an omission of a certain scope, for example, uh, of course, assuming that the contract allows for such omission, and that by this omission, float was created. Um, should the owner be the owner be the owner of that float? Um, the, same, the same concept here is the contract is the law of the contracting parties. So once the, the two parties agreed on a completion date of this project, this means that the contractor has planned his resources, allocation of his resources, and distribution of his resources all over the projects. So once they have agreed on that completion dates or in these intermediate milestones. So the, the client, by all means, he cannot, by his omissions, um, reduce the time for completion of that project. Uh, because he, there is out, out of case in that, maybe, maybe he, his omissions is not on activities on the, on the critical parts of the projects. Um, so, what, so whenever the, the two parties have agreed on a completion date in that project, this cannot be uh, reduced. Um, another approach in that, if the, if the employer has granted an extension of time to the contractor. And after, let's take an example that um, a project of uh, like a 10 story building. So the employer uh, have added five, uh, another five stories. And then he granted the contractor a five months to do it. Then after he omitted two, uh, two story. So can he now um, reduce the time, the, 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 the extent of, extension of time that he have granted to the contractor by two months now? Even in this case, he cannot uh, reduce the extension of time because they have already they have, this have been already granted and this have already been signed. And also, the, there's a lot of contracts dealing with um, in, in this issue. The GCT 98 states in the clause 25.3.6 that no decision of the architecture under clause 25.3.2 or clause 25.3.3.2 shall fix a completion date earlier than the date for completion stated in the appendix. So whenever there is a granted extension of time to the contractor, the employer, whatever omission he have done, reduces extension of time. If you allow me, Dr. Walid, uh, to, to add uh, some comments on, on, uh, on, on what Antoine has mentioned, uh, or maybe debate it a little bit. Uh, uh, for, for sure, as Antoine mentioned, it, it depends on the contract. Uh, uh, and what is written in the contract. But in, in some cases, uh, the omission is, is treated as a variation under the contract. So if we consider the omission as one of the variations, then uh, for sure that variation will have its own consequences, uh, time and cost. Uh, uh, so parties need to agree on what are the consequences of that variation, either uh, reduction in cost, reduction in the time, and agree on uh, a variation order related to that omission. Uh, so it, it might be treated as a variation. And uh, if the parties agree, and I'm sure that will not be the case, uh, they can agree on a variation order for that omission, which reduce uh, uh, the time for completion or reduce the contract duration. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, Antoine. So Antoine, you're, you're, you you say no, it's not, it's not, uh, the owner should not be the owner of that float in the case of an omission. Yes. And, and Ahmed, you, uh, what's your opinion? It's, it's a, it's a shared I, 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 would, I, I would say if, if it is a variation and uh, it really reduces the time for completion, then it needs to be signed as a variation order and it will reduce uh, the time for completion. If they agree to keep the time for completion as it is, then the float will remain a shared resource. Okay, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll continue from what you, where you just stopped. Uh, Ahmed, this will be actually the, 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 the uh, beginning of my second question. My next question to Hassan, uh, you mentioned agreed, if they agreed. So uh, of course, I'm sure we all can agree that uh, if the parties have a plot, float uh, ownership clause in the contract that actually maybe even uh, addresses the points that we are raising today in very clear words, uh, that could resolve the problem, right? So uh, my question to Hussam is, uh, if the contract has a specific clause regarding uh, float ownership or, or any of the topics that we're discussing right now, such as omission of work, as, as, as Ahmed mentioned, a variation, um, all these things, uh, do you think, Hassan, that uh, this would help matters or confuse them more? Okay, uh, my answer would be very short. Uh, this uh, could uh, impact a project with a potential risk, which is killing flexibility. Killing flexibility. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I said, if a clause in, in the contract, for example, say that uh, the ownership of the float is to the owner, of the employer. Uh, how can the contractor grant the required flexibility to finish a complex project? Uh, of course, if I said it, it, is, it, it is the contractor uh, ownership or the contractor is the one owns the float, so I'm giving him full, full uh, flexibility to do whatever he wants. However, uh, uh, if it's open, if it's flexible, I don't recommend it to me. As a planner, as, a, as someone who's working in time schedules, I know the nature of huge schedules. I prefer to leave it to the benefit of who need, of those who need it. Okay, of those who need it. So I believe no, it is uh, not 100% uh, 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 something that can help. It is it most probably will subject the project to a potential risk, which is. Uh, limiting or giving limitations that uh, limitations that I'm just looking for the word right word uh, that are not necessary. So even even if the clause says that it's a shared resource on a yeah, yeah shared sure. resource of course yeah, this, this, this but but, but I, I believe if, if if it's silent it goes automatically to my in my view if it's silent if the contract is silent it goes automatically to that shared resource thing but if it is saying that it's shared resource hot. There's no, there's no issue here. But, but, but the thing is limiting the ownership of the float to a certain party. Mm -hmm. This will uh, somehow give uh, wide flexibility that can be driven to, or can drive the product to monopolization, or can drive the schedule to monopolization, or uh, something that a, a clever contractor can do to grant himself time, or Kill that flexibility. I'm not. I'm saying the word "kill" here for the float, not for the, <laughs> as a negative, as a negative part. Or uh, limit the flexibility of the, of, 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 of the contractor uh, to uh, grant the dynamic that I talked about at the beginning of the session. Thank you, Sam. Actually, on this point, I just want to mention. You guys remember when I presented uh, a sample of the articles and I mentioned uh, James Zach's article on scheduling games. But well, actually, in that article, he has a sample of a uh, float sharing clause. Actually, a float sharing clause is one of uh, is one of his recommendations regarding the game of of, of float ownership. And so, uh, you, you might want to check that article and, and see what he has to say. Thank you, Sam, for your response. Uh, I'll continue with you still. <laughs> Not that we let, let you off the hook yet. <laughs> so, uh, do you think is there a relationship uh, between uh, flows ownership and uh, the choice of delay analysis? Uh, allow me to rephrase the question, Wally. Yeah, there is a, a relationship, direct relationship between the float 
and the choice method. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, consequently, there is a relationship between uh, the flow, ownership, and the choice of method. There are a lot of factors actually that affect and impact uh, the choice of the planner or the forensic analyst uh, uh, and drive him to a certain uh, method. Uh, or, a certain, uh, or a certain methodology or a certain mood of analyzing. However, let's just keep it simple. The delay analysis is the uh, out or, 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 or the delay claims or the extension time claim. Doing a good claim is how do you consume the flow and prove that you, the event that the owner or the delay that the contractor caused, consume the flow. So if you are having a good structured uh, program, and actually uh, if you are referring to uh, the uh, generally accepted scheduled principles de de developed by the association uh, of how to evaluate the schedule, there, will, there is a point that states that you have a certain criteria to the flow to judge that this program is, is, is good. Is, is suit and consequently suitable for doing a proper delay analysis. So let's presume that everything is good and everything is, is, is clear with uh, the schedule. The type of consuming the float and the difficulty of how you present how you're consuming the float drives you to a certain methodology, is that professional or whatever method. And, and if you are saying that, again, I will, I will just repeat myself. If you are saying that this code is owned by someone, it will make the life of the contractor very easy to issue a claim in any, in any methodology. And if you are just fixing uh, in any methodology, and if you are fixing that this is a certain ownership of someone or a contractor of the owner, you can just go to a very simple method to prove that you consume the code. Quite the contrary, if you are giving the ownership of the, of, of the flow to the contractor, for example, and say the contractor owns the flow and he can do whatever, whatever he wants with the flow, and the contractor is planning to develop an extension of time claim analysis, he will automatically go to uh, uh, a methodology that will, uh, let's say, camouflage or uh, fogitize the, uh, the, 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 the games he played with Suppose the, the games he played with changing this float and changing the sequence every now and then just to, to grant himself that uh, no delay will cure or no concurrence will. So yes, um, I'm, I'm just uh, I spoke too much, but yes, uh, the, the the ownership of the float uh, affects the, uh, the methodology, the choice of methodology of basic delay analysis, and the quality of the program in terms of float affects the choice of methodology or whatever methodology you are using. We have 12 methodologies, uh, according to the RP29 of three, uh, which by the way, has never mentioned anything related to the uh, direct declaration of the ownership of the flow. However, if, uh, sorry, the, the, the program type and the program, the, the flow type and the ownership flow, yes, they affect that, how to choose that delay analysis. So I think I think actually from uh, what you're saying, uh, and by virtue of the question, when we say that the, the program and you talk about the program and the flows in the program, so and, and as you mentioned, there are like 12 different methodologies. This would uh, exclude. Uh, there are some methodologies that don't depend even on the program. So you have an as-built schedule, for example. Yeah, this another uh, uh, yeah. built that doesn't even need a program. So it does need a program, but but it does yeah, it does need a program. I'm just I'm sorry to, to check this. But yeah, it does need a program. The 3.8 and 3.9, which are the last aspect, or this is the common name of the sort of that, that the attractive methods in general, they need a program and they need an aspect, but, but they don't need neither the baseline nor any update. You create a program from scratch as the aspect schedule and you do analysis. You, and there's, you, and there's no you, the, that there is no flow, flow because they are depending on that oh, on the action. Yes. That's, that, this is, that, that's how they present. So, so the ownership of the stuff here. Has minimal impact on how you choose that. Thank you. I don't know if we have time, so I comment or, or we're running out of time.
Okay, just to add to, uh, to, to what uh, my colleagues mentioned, and again to, to stress on that, uh, uh, that the recommended practice 29, uh, uh, which is uh, the AECI recommended practice 29, uh, th there is a table which speaks about the methods and, and how uh, each method is, has limitation. And uh, as exactly as Hossein mentioned, uh, the two methods, the subtractive method, which is the 3.8 and 3.9, which we, we, we call it the collapsed as belt. Those two methods, one of their key limitation is the issue of the early completion dealing with the float changing and so on. Uh, so those two particular methods uh, have the limitation of the method of studying the float. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, I just want to clarify to our viewers who are not uh, familiar with AAC International, that AAC International has, in addition to the uh, articles that I mentioned and all of this uh, information, there's something called the recommended practices, which have, uh, they're made by uh, experts in the industry uh, and they, they basically have, they go from everywhere from risk management to, uh, to uh, delay analysis, to uh, lo uh, productivity loss, uh, uh, all these things, uh, scheduling, critical uh, path identification. And, and uh, that's one of the famous ones. It's called Recommended Practice 29 R-03, which talks about uh, several uh, delay analysis methodologies uh, done retrospectively from a retrospective basis. And as uh, I mentioned, uh, 3.8 and 3.9. These are these are called uh, uh, method implementation method protocols. implementation protocols. MIPs. So uh, for each delay analysis, just just so that you are familiar with what we're what we're. Uh, and allow me to add, Walid, there is another recommended practices for uh, the prospective analysis. Yes. The RP twenty nine R dash O three is for the retrospective analysis, the forensic analysis, which are retrospect doing being done retrospectively. There is another RP called RP5206, uh, 06 something, 06, yeah. It is for the prospective analysis, which is commonly known, one of the uh, methods commonly known as the TIA. So in the, in the, in the AACEI culture, when you say TIA, it goes uh, uh, by default that you are talking about prospective analysis. And, and, anyway. and TIA is uh, for time, time impact analysis. Yeah. Time impact analysis. Uh, now we're in question number six, and I direct it to uh, Antoine. Uh, Antoine, as you've seen, uh, one of in, in, uh, James uh, Zach's paper, he refers to float banking. So if you can uh, please um, explain to us uh, what is float banking, and uh, also how effective do you think this would be in uh, resolving this, the float ownership issue? Actually, it's a very interesting topic, the float banking. But let me just explain it in a very simple example. Um, I will share something now on the screen. So some of the contracts allow the parties to bank the fl any float. So the party who is creating this float is owning it. So let's say um, in a simple example, um, for who, who doesn't understand what is the, the meaning of the banking of float. So let's say I have a critical pass. Um, it's combined activity between the contractor and the, the client. So let's say, for example, the contractor will start with the earthwork and then continue with the foundation, and then the client will install something and then the testing and commissioning by the contractor. And this pass has a total float of zero. Then let's say that the, the earthwork had been finished by the contractor five days earlier. So the contractor here has created a five days of float. So we are seeing here that the contractor here is banking a float. He created a five days of float, which he, his own, he owned these five days. Um, although that this example so, yeah, looks easy and maybe like very easy to understand, but it's very difficult in the practical life because of the, the, the dynamic change of the critical path of the updated schedule. Um, it's, it's dramatic in each update, the dramatic change, like all the, all the, all the activities, all the sequence, in the business schedule are not, um, are not totally are not the same in the updated schedule. So you can see, you can see in the updates that this activity start to start, uh, the, the other activity on other passes uh, jump into this pass. So you can never um, have a reference in measuring this, uh, this this created float in the updated schedule. So uh, this is uh, simply the, the, the definition of banking a float. 
Um, in a practical life, I have never seen it in a contract except maybe one contract I have ever worked with, but it, in, in the practicality of it, um, in the delay analysis and, and that uh, issues is not that, that easy. Thank you, Antoine. So uh, do you think it would be effective if, if this method was uh, practically used uh, on the ground? Um, of course, if, it's, if, if it can be like a very high level can be determined, it will be, um, it will be fair that the party who has created and has mitigated and not mitigated, who has created this float should be owned it. Because he is the one who have worked in a, in a in a very progressive way in um, in a very good matter, and he created some contingency for the other uh, for the other activity in the past in his past. So he should be on this tool. But um, the, the question also remains: How is it going to be implemented in real life? Yes, I was actually thinking the same thing, Asha. As you were speaking, I'm thinking: How would we draft a clause that? would address this issue and how it would be done and you know and, and what are the kinds of disputes that may arise from this class so i think that's a topic that is interesting uh, on its own merit and now we come to the last question that i i would ask all of you uh which is uh now this has to do with okay when we're measuring flows on any project um there's we have two maybe frames of reference so the common frame of reference is the uh, the contract completion date. So when I say contract completion date, I mean the date that is agreed upon between the two parties. So we have a date in the beginning in the contract, the time for completion, for example, and as it's referred to in credit contract, uh, and this time for completion date can only be amended through a uh, mutually agreed and signed variation order or through an amendment. That's how that completion date will be amended. So we measure the flow uh, from, and this is one of the schools of thought, from this uh, date and anything that goes beyond that date is a negative float, okay? And you might have neg several negative floats passed, but, but they're negative. The other school of thought is called the longest path theory, and, and regardless of what the contract completion date is, we look at the longest path and the schedule, and you measure the float from there. So you can have can possibly have an activities that are after the contract completion date, but because they're not, they don't lie on the longest path to completion, then their float is, is not negative. It would be positive. So my question to all of you, when we talk about floats, what is your frame of reference? The contract completion date or the longest path? So I'll, I'll, I'll do it in the same order as we have done with the first question. Uh, I'll start with Hussam, then Antoine, then Ahmed. So Hussam. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a, a, a very complicated question, I think. Uh, actually, it needs uh, uh, maybe uh, another event or another uh, session to, to even touch base on the answer. But anyway, uh, regardless the, the the methodology, whether it's negative flow theory or uh, longest path theory, uh, whenever you have a time for completion, you have to stick to this time for completion unless it's changed by uh, contract amendment or addendum or extension of time granted or something like this. So when I do forensic planning or prospective or prospective analysis of any time uh, time extension of time analysis, I always refer to the contractual finish, regardless of the tier. Maybe it, it is different from the contract contract point of view. However, uh, as analysis, I do it reference to the last uh, unchanged time for completion. So when I start analyzing each party's delay, if I have a, an owner delay and another uh, contractor delay that caused a more a shift to the time for completion by the owner, for example, and there is another parallel day coming from the contractor, I still have the line of the time for completion. However, I consider that there is a long path, a longest path here caused by the employer. So this longest path is granted to the uh, contractor either way. And the difference, the parallel path, if it's parallel, or the next path that I need to dispatch in order to uh, understand the concurrency in this case is that 
the, 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 the amount of time I'm going to deduct from the uh, granted extension to calculate prolongation costs. So for example, if I have one month delayed by the owner versus the path of completion and 15 days delayed in a parallel path, let's just start, stick with the parallel here, don't mix the two paths because it's another, another case, but there is a 15 days within a parallel path at this window, at this whatever method I'm implementing, caused by the contractor. So the contractor is granted the one month, however, he's going to pay for 15 days. As if the owner granted him 100 days of compensable flow and he consumed 15 days. So the 15 days is not being paid, is not going to be paid, and the 100 is going to be granted only as the one month. So I think as a, as a, as a contract person, uh, the one word that I have some uh, uh, problems with or concerns with, which you have actually reiterated a lot, is the word granted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's granted, you know, uh, from my perspective, yeah, either know. either an engineer determined it or there's a, a mutually agreed time extension. But I think this is the, in, the interesting part of this question is that it really it uh, hits at the heart of uh, contract, of contract for pra practitioners. Uh, believe is a time for completion, and also for forensic planners uh, believe, which is uh, a lot of them would believe that there's a, a, a the longest path really is, regardless of the contract completion date, there's a longest path, and this is where I measure for. Thank you so much, uh, Hatem. Um, uh, Antoine, what do you think? Um, actually, I agree that, that uh, what you have guys has just sent data of now, but um, for me, I had to look first at the contract. What is the contract saying about uh, what is the contract definition about the critical path? How is defining the critical path in the projects? Uh, but usually, usually in my practical life, for the for the when I'm measuring any delays, uh, let's say in a, in a window basis, for me, I, I'm always dealing with the longest path. So what is what is the path that is delaying the project completion date? Even if I have a parallel path that is delaying the project completion date, but it's not the longest one, I'm considering that the longest path in this project is creating more float. To, to, to the other path, which is also delayed uh, from the project completion dates. So for me, I'm always you know, dealing with the longest path, and I, I see that this is the this is the one, this is the path that creates a, a delay in the or, or this is the one that's responsible for the delays in this project. Uh, this is my, my view in it. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, I just want to mention also very briefly that um, According to AACE's recommended practice 29R-03 and to uh, STL's Delay and Disruption Protocol uh, second edition, there is a clear ad uh, advocation for the longest path, uh, much to the dismay of a lot of uh, contract uh, practitioners, if I might say that. But uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, Ahmed, what do you think? I will not have a lot to add. Uh, I was just going to say what you exactly mentioned that uh, it, it's it's mainly uh, contract issues that need to be defined very well by parties, uh, because even those uh, international practices they are they are referring to unless there is an agreement by the parties and also to the jurisdiction in the country that you are applying that contract in. Uh, so still, uh, some some of the experts are towards applying. Uh, the longest pass here. So they say that if there is a longest pass uh, driven by one of the parties, that longest pass should be our reference to the float. And that longest pass would create float in any other passes if to the other party to use. So still some of the experts are towards applying that approach. And as you mentioned, the SCL, when it dealt with concurrency, uh, uh, was towards applying the longest pass uh, theory, not, not the other critical buses and the contract completion theory. So it, it highly depends on uh, how the contract is drafted and also on the part is dealing during the project. There might be the case that during the project itself, during the progress monitoring, the parties have already agreed that the completion date is shifted from one update to another and they stopped reporting negative float. So it, it, it might be the case that impliedly the parties agreed that every update we have a completion date. There is no more negative float. We have only longest bus. All the other buses have float to be utilized by the other party. So it, it depends on many circumstances. I cannot give a black and white answer to that. Uh, Ahmed, thank you very much for your input. Um, actually, I think you hit it on the head. 
uh, with two, I think, key issues. The first one is that uh, this should be definitely a, a matter that is specified very clearly in the contract so that to avoid disputes. Um, and the second thing, I like your idea about the conduct of the parties, because of course that, that really, really matters. So even if the contract says something, but the conduct, the conduct is consistently something else, as you mentioned, for example, the update, and that really reflects the party's uh, true uh, agreement. So that's, that's, thank you for that. And with that, uh, guys, we, we have completed my questions, and now we'll open the floor to the Q&A. So what we'll do is uh, I'll go through uh, the Q&A on a, the, the first and, and um, chronological order, I mean, the, the, the order that they have been posted. And uh, we'll just answer with whatever time we have uh, left. So we have almost a few, a few minutes, maybe uh, 20 minutes or something. So we'll go through the questions and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll answer them. First question uh, by uh, Osama Salah uh, to Sam. Uh, first come, first serve. Uh, don't you think that this is unfavorable for the party who comes last? Yeah, in, 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 in restaurants, yeah. And then in, 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 uh, in, in, in boarding passes, yeah, it's, it's also unfavorable for those who came late. But uh, first comes, first served here, or first come, first served here, doesn't mean that uh, everybody is on a, a race to, uh, to get uh, the flow. Uh, first come, first serve here means that the one who needs it first, the one who needs the flow, needs the flow for real reasons. First, he can use it, as simple as this. So it's, uh, it's not about uh, favorable or unfavorable. It's about uh, dynamic, highly dynamic projects that requires changing in strategy and changing of construction methodology every, maybe every day. And uh, all of a sudden, some, uh, someone uh, can just stop and say, I need to revise my methodology and, and, and and of course, this is uh, 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 something related to uh, practical uh, construction reality, practical, practical construction project reality. This mm. is okay. Have done in this thank you, thank you, uh, Sam. Um, um, Mr. Amr Medhi uh, asks the question: uh, uh, Are there examples of close ownership disputes? So. Uh, Ahmed, I'd like to uh, throw this question to you in terms of, did you come across any case uh, that has put on disputes? Yes, yes, for sure there is, uh, for sure there is. And uh, that, that will take us back to uh, your question, Reid, when you said, uh, will uh, writing a uh, clause in the contract uh, reduce uh, the disputes or it will increase the disputes? Uh, and and, uh, and as, as you both mentioned, if the clause is saying it's a project uh, ownership, it's a resource uh, for each of the parties to use, then for sure that will reduce the disputes. But if the clause is written in a way that it belongs to the employer or it belongs to the contractor, I believe this will increase uh, the dispute. I was involved in a case where the contract was clearly saying uh, float is owned by the employer and that was written in the contract. And uh, the lawyers starting debating about, uh, okay, but the float itself is not defined. Do you mean the baseline float or the updated float? Uh, do you mean uh, a negative float or the positive float, blah, blah, blah. And they started disputing and debating what is the definition of the plot? What is the definition of ownership? Does this ownership means uh, I will pay you compensation or I will only uh, relieve you from damages? So what is that meaning of ownership? So the, uh, that in that case, this was a reason for a much more disputes between the parties. And if it was not there, it for sure uh, will, will be uh, reducing the dispute. So that's one of the cases which I have dealt with. Uh, that's that's uh, interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, the uh, there's a, there's a question uh, by uh, Josh Keller. Uh, I think it's more more like a comment. So a five day activity has 100 days of float. The designer uses all 100 days of the float for a redesign. The contractor then takes seven days to perform that activity under the float sharing theory. That the designer has not delayed the job, but the contractor delayed the job for two days. How is that fair? So, uh, and he comments that the standard float sharing theory favors the party that goes first, and this favors contractors because their activities come last. Please address this as it is patently 
inequitable. So do you guys, uh, anyone want to comment on the statement? I, I can comment if you want, uh, unless Sam wants to jump in. No, no, yeah, I, will, I will follow you, Ahmed. I, I, I have a comment, of course, but just start first. Yeah, but, but, but I will just say that if you apply the theory on, on both parties, then you are fair. So yes, it might be the case similar to what explained here and it favored the client uh, or it favors the contract or sorry, it favors the client, but there might be another case later on after a few months that will favor it as a client. So if you apply the theory to both parties and every party can, party can make use of that theory, then you, it, it will be a fair application of that theory. I have just, uh, yes, uh, I, I, I totally agree with Ahmed in, uh, in this point. The other thing is the type of contract, uh, the type of contract uh, uh, will, affect, will affect the uh, way, uh, in, if particularly in this case, because uh, if you are working with an APC contract, for example, the designer is the contractor, right? Yeah, in the, in, 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 you're working in, in an APC contract, the designer is the contractor. The other thing is, Guys, uh, uh, you are talking about a certain activity, one activity out of thousands of activities inside the project construction of the construction project. So uh, it's it's not turning the uh, float ownership into a race between two parties to who will gain the the, 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 the float first. It's all about who needs the float, not who gets there first. We need the flow first. So this is just a, 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 just a, a slight comment on uh, what Ahmed adequately answered this question. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Santosh uh, to Antoine. So is the type of contract, whether it's lump sum, uh, cost plus, etc., is that a criteria for determining the ownership of flow? Um, actually, uh, if it's not mentioned in the contract, who is the owner of this float? So it means nothing. But uh, according to, um, to to the article in the Journal of Construction Engineering, which is uh, published by a guy called Rutland in the ASCE, he, he picked up this approach that according to a, to a contract type, it should be it should be knowing what who is the, who is the owner of this float. He he, he particularly like uh, addressed this issue according to the risk. So he's saying that if the contractor bears all the risk in this contract, so he should be the one who's owning the floats. And then the, the same with the, as a client, if it's a, is a, if it's a contract of a cost plus fee, so the client here is the one who is being, is on at the risk in this contract, so he's the one who's owning the float here. Uh, okay, the, the, uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, we have a question to uh, Sam uh, by, from Osama Sadaf saying, I did not get what is the relationship between uh, 3.8, 3.9. He's still referring to the method implementation protocols under uh, Recording Practice 29R 03 and uh, as built schedule. Would you please clarify? Uh, uh, I just I stopped to lead uh, uh, unfortunate I, uh, sorry Walid, I stopped you when I saw this uh, statement uh, Osama uh, Osama uh, uh, it's out of the context of this uh, session uh, however uh, in the RP2903 there is a classification of methods and the, the, the most detailed one called method implementation protocol and they are listing nine uh, method implementation protocols two of them are 3.8 and 3.9 3.8 and 3.9 are the methods where you are using or you are creating an aspect schedule, including the, de uh, the delays from both parties and start collapsing and start dissolving these delays to see the actual and real uh, impact on the real status of the project. Anyway, if you are interested in knowing more, I'm not going to consume the time of, uh, of, of the question uh, in elaborating on this. If you are willing to uh, or are wishing to understand more, you can just open the uh, or take a look at the RP2903. If you want more, just you need to contact the uh, ACA page, and most probably I will answer you uh, regarding this uh, question. Okay. Thank you, Sam. We have a question, uh, a second question from Mr. Keller. Uh, what if the float in the schedule is not real? but instead uh, is the result of deficiencies in the schedule. 
uh, after all, most CPM schedules are flawed and of, often those flaws uh, create excessive flow. So that's an interesting twist. I'll open the floor to any of you guys uh, who'd like to answer that question. Who would like to, to go first? Uh, I will not because I see Josh commented in the previous answer that he's weak. No, sorry, I'm just, just kidding. But uh, uh, just to comment on that, all the delay analysis method have something called uh, source validation. And in that source validation, uh, as, as a delay analyst or an expert in delay, you have to validate the baseline. Uh, and one of those validation, if you find any of the relationship is not reasonable and uh, is not justified or has no basis, and that relationship was the reason of causing that unrealistic float, uh, you have the right to uh, validate and, and even modify that program or that source before using it. And this applies not only to the baseline, this applies even to the program updates. So yes, it is a case that it might be an unreasonable float in the program. The delay expert or the delay analyst or the guy doing the analysis has the free to correct that and modify it uh, before he runs his analysis. Um, actually, I want to add something here. This is a uh, most common case in all uh, in the practical uh, life in, in creating in, in the creating the baseline schedules. But the thing is that there is a risk here. I mean, the, the one who is creating this baseline schedule is putting uh, is putting the the schedule on risk when when he's doing something like this. Maybe because of an uh, unexperienced guy who is creating this baseline schedule. But at the end, I cannot, in my point of view, I cannot claim. And saying that this schedule um, or this activity are not realistic with a realistic duration, so I should take uh, some of this float and uh, adjust my activity and enlarge these durations to um, to just correct my mistakes in the baseline schedule. So this is yeah, my view in that. I would like to add something from a contractual point of view: uh, is that if the, this flawed schedule um, has, and I, if I use Ahmed's words, uh, has been uh, accepted by the conduct of the parties. So even so, so it has been accepted as the schedule on which the contractor is submitting updates, and it's been used for uh, claims, and it's been used for for months, maybe years. Then I think contractually the uh, the, the, the the schedule has been approved with its flaws and uh, the flaws in it as well. So uh, that that's another point. If, if there's a, a flawed schedule, then there must be a clear rejection, uh, reservation by the engineer, for example, uh, about, about, the, about the schedule. Do you want to say something, Hassan? Okay, there's a question uh, here um, by, and I hope I, I, I'm not pronouncing the, the name correct, Dulita. Okay, so I'll just, you're responsible now for if there's any uh, mistake. Uh, so what, what is meant by terminal float? Uh, anyone uh, who would like to respond? Terminal float? I, I came across the terminology before. Uh, I did not deal with it in, in practical life, so uh, I, I don't have an answer for it. But yes, there is a terminology called terminal float, uh, and uh, it is defined in some of the articles, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Uh, uh... Well, term, terminal float is not uh, a terminology, actually. Uh, terminal float is something that came by practice when you have a float and then this float disappears in the next update. This, this is one of the uh, slide definitions of the terminology of the word terminal floats. So if you have this update, you created a float, and then you in the, in the next update, the, the float is, 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 not, is not there. Uh, this is the meaning of terminal float, but uh, actually it's not something that you rely on in any analysis or any communication because it is a terminal float. Uh, the other uh, level of terminal float that you have, you create a float uh, in an update of 10 days and the float in the next update is three days, the same day on, the, on this path, on this activity. So it's not a reliable float, it's a one, it's a one to one uh, float. And, Normally, the terminal float is for short-term projects. It, it, goes for, it, it goes for short short-term projects like six months, or you make update every week, or every something like this. So that is the meaning of terminal float. But this is something we not we don't normally use in reporting or uh, 
uh, if you are doing uh, delay analysis or something like this, this is not something that we commonly use in in our uh, practitioner practitioning of uh, of whatever we are doing. Here. Thank you, Sam. We have a question from Adi. Uh, how's float mapping? How can that assist in delay analysis? What does float mapping mean? I, I, I believe I, I might uh, I might answer that uh, so, some of the practitioners is, is using that uh, method where they compare the float between one update and another and see how how the float have been changed from one update to another and they're calling it the float mapping delay analysis. So when you have, for example, in a certain update a negative two days of float in a certain activity and that activity was impacted by an employer or by a contractor due to an event. And in the next update, due to that impact, the negative float have increased from negative two to negative five. Then you lost three days because of that uh, changes in the float from one update to another. So that is what the practitioners call float mapping exercise. It is used in the delay analysis, but it, it is not commonly used. Thank you, uh, Ahmed. We have a question from uh, Haytham. Uh, if the owner used the float on some activities and this led to impact an impact on the contractor's construction methodology and resource allocation with the cost impact, is the contractor entitled for uh, compensation? Antoine, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I can answer this question. Um, first of all, we have to think about what, what type of compensation um, is a contractor entitled to. Um, but first thing, uh, there is no resource allocation in, in a float. So um, whatever, like uh, if I have like a, a, a float in this pass, so I have like um, a buffer time. So there is no resources in that. This is a free time that uh, an activity can be delayed without even um, impacting the project completion date. But of course, if, if, there is a, if there is a floated pass, and I have a float in this bus, and the, the client like delay me if I'm a, if I'm a contractor, and the client delay me in this bus uh, or consume this float. Um, I can ask here, or I, or I can think here about a compensation of a disruption claim here. Like um, if 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 this delay is not uh, impacting the project completion date, but um, I have disrupted my resources here. Um, I'm planning to do my job here, like in 10 days. I stayed for 15 days doing this job, so I can ask here for a compensation for a direct uh, claim. I, I, I would like to add uh, to Antoine, what Antoine mentioned, I, I believe mainly the question about the resource allocation, because I had a case uh, with a similar scenario where, where, the con where the contractor have hired a loader to do a certain excavation and the activity was not in the critical bus, so it was including some float. And suddenly the employer decided to make some change to the levels of the excavation. So the contractor has had to keep that uh, uh, resource ideal in the site and has to pay cost because of that. And uh, because of uh, the employer reply was, it is not critical, you have a float, so you are not entitled. Uh, however, I'm, I'm with the opinion of uh, Antoine, uh, and again, it's paid depending on what the contract mentioned. Uh, the cost claim is something different than the time claim and something different than uh, the float ownership. So if he's entitled under the contract to claim for that event from the employer uh, as a disruption or as an ideal resource or whatever he call it, uh, he, he should be entitled to get it if it's not his fault. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, we have a question uh, from uh, Amru Ahmed. Uh, please share your opinion for uh, restrictions of the float. Uh, he's saying some contractors use excessive float in the baseline. So, uh, so are there any restrictions uh, that should be taken into consideration? Uh, and also, additionally, how can we judge uh, these cases um, uh, when, when, as far as extension of time is concerned? If, if the baseline is approved with this excessive float in it. So are there any restrictions that should be taken into account uh, for float or is the matter open, uh, especially if the schedule is approved? Who would like to I, I, I will jump in. Uh, there, there is nothing uh, clear cut on that. Uh, there is a lot of papers talking about a certain amount of, uh, of float. There is uh, some criteria to uh, define what is excessive float. 
Uh, some articles talking about don't exceed the duration of activity by three times. Some other articles talking about 100 days as an allowed load. But all of that are, are articles is not a clear cut uh, for, for answering that. So uh, I, I would say that uh, th there is no uh, criteria to uh, insist on a certain amount of number of load not to exceed uh, in, in the baseline, unless, unless, and I have seen that, it is written in the specifications or the contract itself. Some employers in the specification insist that flow should not exceed that number of days. So if that is the case and it's written in the contract, it should be respected in the programs. I, I lost the connection with Walid. I'm not sure it's from my side or it's from his side. Antoine, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I think it's from Walid's side, yeah, Ahmed. If you allow me to interfere, um, I can um, read some questions, maybe after the question of Am. Uh, Anonymous question says, so in submissions prior to analyzing float ownership, what should the planner take into consideration? Uh, well, I will, I will say that, that some, somehow uh, a general question, but for, for the planner, they, they need to take in consideration the realistic sequence for the network. And that realistic sequence for the network will create the, the, the float for each of the activities. So my, my advice to the planners will be not to focus on uh, the float itself instead of focusing on the logic of the network. So if, if you are confident that the logic of the network is fine, then you don't need to worry a lot about uh, uh, the, the float of that activity. I, I believe we have Walid uh, back uh, connected. Yeah, Walid back, then I will go back to the background. <laughs> I will take also, I'll jump to this question. I will take the devil side here <laughs> for the planners in the baseline schedule. Um, my, my advice also to the baseline, to the, to the planner in creating, when creating the baseline schedule is to somehow think about creating some contingency or some buffers in, in their activity, not just to leave this excessive float and um, just to create their activity uh, at a very high risk durations. So um, whenever there is a float in this schedule, I'm, I'm not saying that you, you use it all and you make your, your schedule, uh, all, this, all your activity in the schedule are, all are critical, but at least you have to make some contingency uh, or some buffer in your activities. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, there is a question uh, by uh, Mr. Ram. Uh, the float is determined by the logic uh, sequence uh, that is created in the baseline and consumed as long as the uh, project goes by. So the question is why would the contracting parties dispute over float consumption instead of identifying uh, the root cause of the delays? Uh, I have a, a, a straightforward, uh, not a straightforward, a very logic answer because no time while the construction is going on, no, no nobody is, 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 is interesting in uh, just stopping and try to dig into the cause of the delay. Uh, they are just trying to, I, I'm not saying that this is correct, but I'm saying what happen, what's happening on the real case, you know, the re real life. They are focusing, yes, maybe we will study later uh, the causes of the delay and we'll try to eliminate them. However, the, our fo main focus now that is that the flow is consumed and we, 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 we want to continue. So uh, this is just the, 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 the blank, answer, blank answer. Uh, why contracting parties would dispute over the float consumption uh, instead of identifying the root cause of the delay? Yeah, they should do this. However, uh, they are majorly focusing on how to proceed forward, not to dig into something that already happened, okay? Uh, maybe I, I didn't understand the question well, but this is just maybe the uh, I, I spotlighted on the attitude of those who are working on construction uh, construction projects. But there's a there's a concept here. So whenever the float is consumed, there is no delay here. Mm. So um, it, it cannot be measured. 
Yeah, that, that, I, 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 I would say that it's, it still remains disputed, even if uh, the delay is uh, consuming the float, uh, because even there is a, a float in the activity that does not mean that the activity is, is not delayed. It might be prolonged and consume the float. It might be delayed in the start. All of that will mean a delay to the activity. Now, uh, I'm not saying a critical delay, it might not be a critical delay because it's within the float, but it is considered as a float, uh, as, as a delay in that activity. And I believe to answer um, um, the question is, the part is going debate to see what is the consequences of that. So if there was a float and the float is consumed, what is the consequences for that? Uh, am I going to be compensated with no time? Am I going to get additional time and, 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 and no compensation? What is the consequences of uh, the change in the float because of uh, that delay event. So that's why the parties are concerned about the float, plus for sure the cause of the delay event. Um, thank you, uh, Ahmed. Uh, there's a, we have a long question uh, from Rami uh, Norman. Uh, if the contractor repeatedly presents the schedule and the owner deliberately refuses to approve it in order not to be liable for any claim, that sounds familiar. Uh, then the contractor gets delayed or uses up all the float and is about to be delayed and the contractor uh, to cover or defend his delay, he uses, he uses the unapproved schedule with its float for a base of a claim and the owner refuses the claim due to the usage uh, of most of the float by the contractor. So what is the judgment in this case? Uh, I'd like to just start first uh, by saying that, you know, whether we are in... Um, whether we are in uh, the uh, Egypt or Qatar or UAE, uh, we're governed by by uh, laws, uh, civil laws. And so, if the uh, owner in this case is being abusive, then uh, that has a uh, that has a, a, a that that has a, a, a very serious consideration under the law. So, if the contractor can prove that the, the owner has been deliberately uh, and unjustly uh, and, and in bad faith, uh, delaying the approval of the schedule, uh, then that, that would not fly legally. So even if the schedule is not approved uh, and this goes to arbitration, for example, you might find that easy, the arbitrator is very easily swayed towards the contractor in this case, first provided the contractor can, can prove it and provided that because the, the owner can, can simply say that the contractor uh, was not uh, does not provide uh, has, a, has a very flawed schedule, for example, that could not be approved. And actually, uh, even uh, Rami, with what you mentioned, even if the schedule is so flawed, then I would say, and I've been working on the side of, of the, engin the engineer, the, the owners for a long time, that the, the engineer in that case has to make a determination. So even okay, so the schedule is flawed. So what is the contractor entitled to? Uh, that's that's uh, that's one thing that uh, that. Uh, I can mention. You guys, any anyone else has has a uh, anything you want to add to that question? Um, I believe there is a section, but I can't recall um, where in the ACE it's talking about the unapproved baseline schedule that you can still make or you can say create your case even if your baseline schedule is not even approved. Yeah, actually, and also I, I wanted to add that um, even according to U.S. case law. So uh, we've come across some, some I, read, I read some about some cases, and maybe that could be a topic for a different webinar. But even if the schedule is not approved, uh, that does not really mean uh, anything in court. So as long as the schedule was reasonable and the owner kept rejecting it, the courts will definitely, uh, in the US, will take with that reasonable schedule. So uh, that the approval or disapproval of a schedule does not mean, uh, does, not, does not really hold water. Okay, our float time for this webinar is just uh, five more minutes. So we just have time for uh, one, one question, which I think is, is um, we have it here, is actually is, is the last question. If it is impossible to distinguish the culpability of the critical path, a negative float at the time a new employer uh, event is taking place, what is the best approach to determine the impact of this new event? And I don't get the question here. Yes, if it is impossible, impossible to distinguish the capability of the critical path next float 
and the time is taking place, what is the best approach to determine the impact of the casino event? What does this mean? Capability of the critical path is negative float who is the time who is responsible for, for the yeah uh, this is the first question and what is the what is the what is meant by capability of the critical path is negative flow uh, at that time of growth yeah i think yeah 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 i think uh, you, 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 you mean who is responsible for yeah it mean he, 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 he doesn't mean he, the one who is who's responsible for this one yeah, so yes. it's, it's impossible to distinguish who is responsible for a certain delay yeah, yeah. Uh, at the time that uh, Employer, uh, the employer's yeah. delay takes place, so what is the best approach to determine the impact of this new event? So you have a delay taking place by the employer, but at that time point in time, we had no idea what has laid the schedule so far. Uh, who's, who's actually actually I think it's not applicable. Yeah, yeah. What does yeah, yeah, yeah. I I understood the, the 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 concept. However, how can you have a delay that you don't know who caused it? The delay is either employer delay or a contracted delay or force majeure or something that you don't accept it, uh, expect it or something. Um, I, I there, think it, I can add something. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go, 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 ahead, go ahead, Antoine. Go ahead, Antoine. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I understand. <laughs> maybe I understand here that he's saying that um, I, I have here, let's, let's, say, let's say in a case, I have here negative float in the schedule. And at this point of time, let's say, for instance, the schedule is showing uh, minus 10 days of negative float. Yeah. Uh, and um, at this time, I got a new event from the employer. Okay. So what is the best approach to determine the impact of this new event? So if he's talking about like a delay analysis methodology of uh, of like um, knowing how what is the impact of this new event, we can- If the event maybe, occurred maybe, now, then we will go for uh, a perspective, perspective analysis. Yeah, maybe you can use here like a TIA to know what is the status of the schedule before Having this new event and uh, and after impacting this uh, this event on the schedule, what is the new completion date? We can measure what is the variance between uh, the schedule before and after. Maybe but, this is what he's asking for. But I'm, um, what I'm curious is, and this is maybe a, 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 my question. I will add it to question and answer. Uh, how can we have a delay that we don't have? We don't know who's responsible. Is this possible? Have have, have anyone seen something like this before? That yeah. we have a delay in the project and we don't know whether this is a productivity issue or uh, delayed of approval or uh, so some, uh, some, of, yeah. some of the delays are still uh, debatable. Yes, allow me, it's allow it's me not solved until interfere. arbitration. <laughs> allow me to interfere and maybe we can ask the yes, the, 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 the the gentleman who wrote the question to send yeah, it back. I, th I think we still have some few questions we have not answered. And uh, maybe uh, these questions will be answered later. Uh, we, we have it and whoever will be available from the tribunal later, if he have time to answer it, maybe we can send it even by email to, to all the attendees. Allow me to just say a few uh, uh, closing remarks before we finish. Uh, first of all, I'd like to answer the question which is everyone will ask before he leaves. Are we gonna issue certificates? Yes, this is, has a CBDs and our team in uh, coordination with the Asia team will issue Certificates of attendance for everyone who attended today. Uh, second, I'd like to uh, to thank all the attendees for coming today and spending all this time. And again, I would like to apologize for my medical condition, which prevented me to uh, participate actively with the team. Um, uh, the third, uh, I would like to uh, say uh, a statement about that. None of these opinion which has been presented today, because most of the speakers are professional. Uh, delay experts and they are doing um, a lot of arbitrations and uh, uh, reports doesn't actually present their own views on the matter, but it's just may maybe uh, presenting um, 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 a view on a specific subject. So it cannot be held against them uh, in, in this uh, view. The, the last thing I would like to, to thank uh, Dr. Walid, uh, the contract director of Hell International Africa. Uh, uh, for organizing this and you know uh, being uh, full supportive to our team and to the, to the whole team of AEC International um, in, in the region and uh, you know um, I would say uh, now globally to organize this one with me. I would like to ask Hossam, uh, sorry, I would like to thank Hossam Kandil, uh, project manager of um, uh, at National uh, Bank of Kuwait and also a well-known name in the project control uh, arena 
I'd like to thank Ahmed Abdelbaqi, a managing director and, and the delay expert at JS Health. I'd like to thank Antonio uh, Mikhail, a forensic planner and delay analyst manager, contracts and claim department of Ruskin Construction. And I'd like to thank all the attendees and I'll leave the, the final words to the Walid and the speakers. And again, I really uh, enjoyed uh, being with you guys today and I learned a lot from what you have uh, said to everyone. And thank you so much for this. Thank you so much, Saad, and, and we all, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Greater Cairo Section and uh, Qatar and AT International uh, as a whole, we thank you for the initiative and um, thank you for your efforts and we wish you a speedy recovery. And I'd like to just like to thank uh, all the attendees uh, and all the panelists. Uh, uh, the panelists, you guys have been great. You've uh, shared some very interesting information. Uh, so thank you very much and thank the attendees and, and that's uh, what we have for today. So look out for our future uh, ASE activities and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you there. So thank you very much. Take care. Have a, have a good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you.